Welcome to another sneak peek Saturday at the Alameda Free Library. My name is Jenny and today we're going to read a book that I was very much looking forward to um, and it is called The Coming Forest. Um, One Man's Epic Run Across America by Rob Hope. There you go. Uh, you can find this in our news section um, and of course you know you can place a hold on it if you want to make sure that it's available. Like always I'm going to read you the insight uh, of the flap so you have a little bit of an idea what this is going to be about if you haven't guessed yet um, and then we're gonna get started. Okay. The Coming Forest is the incredible story of Englishman Rob Pope, a veterinarian who left his job in pursuit of a dream to become the first person ever to complete the epic run undertaken by one of Hollywood's most beloved characters, Forrest Gump. After his mama urged him to do one thing in life that made a difference, he flew to Alabama, put on his running shoes and sped off into the wilderness. His remarkable journey covered the distance from <clears throat> the north to the south pole and a third of the way back. Over a grueling 18 months, braving injuries, blizzards, forest fires, and deadly wildlife, he crossed the United States five times. During one of the most turbulent periods in recent American history, Rob immersed himself in American life. His time on the open road saw him forever changed in the process of becoming Forrest. This is a tale of one man who just wanted to make a difference. So let's get started. Ah, just want to show you this cool map here. Leg one, 15 September to 30th of November, 2016, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, 2,259.45 miles. Chapter one, time to roll, tide, Alabama, days one to three, 49.4 miles. Road kill count, seven, Three armadillos, two possums, and two raccoons. Chased by a dog count, one, it was a chihuahua. Enquiries after my sanity, one. Encounters with potentially life-threatening spiders, one. What would you like? The barber asked. I've always found it a strangely intimidating question. Today, even more so. I'd been want waiting an hour before sitting in his chair and had watched him meticulously groom a procession of locals with clippers and flashing cut throat. Tentatively, I produced a photo of Tom Hanks, or more to the point of photo of his hair do from the film Forrest Gump. To help, I also quoted a number at him from the menu of styles pinned to the door, like number 24, please. He looked at me with a raised eyebrow. You want a high and tight? Yep. Yes, please. Are you kidding me, man? It seemed only polite to explain why a veterinarian from Liverpool had traveled all the way to Flukes Bobs on North Broad Street in Mobile, Alabama on the morning of Thursday, 15 September 2016. Before my journey was through, I'd get very used to telling this story. I'm recreating the Forrest Gump run, like from the movie? Yeah, I'm going to run from here to Santa Monica in California. Forrest made five crossings in total and someone has calculated that this was a distance of 15,248 miles, all told apparently for no particular reason. A number of athletes had already made a single crossing, but as far as I knew, nobody had ever done five. People had written articles about whether it was even possible. I wasn't sure, but I wanted to be the guy who tried. 
That said, I'd only mentioned the possibility of doing five crossings to one person, my girlfriend Nadine, aka Nats. That's much running, that much running seemed like a pipe dream, so the official version was that I try one crossing and take it from there. The barber was incredulous, even about one crossing. That's a long way. He couldn't suppress his grin. You don't you done this kind of thing before? I shrugged. Not exactly. A few marathons and one ultra marathon. He nodded. And how far have you got? I was bursting with excitement. This day one, a local news station is filming the start. So I wanted to look the part. Well, good luck to you, man. He said, chuckling to himself as the first logs drifted to the floor while everyone in the shop cast sideways glances. <clears throat> 40 minutes later, I was fit for the US Marine Corps in looks at least, and I spent the next few hours enjoying the novelty of touching the back of my newly shorn hair, head and my face. Several blocks away, the WKRG local news team were waiting for me. It was time to begin. I've always had a vivid imagination. Maybe it's the lot of single child of a single child, or maybe it's just the way my brain works. But I always knew it might get me into trouble someday. I got into running at an early age. I was already a marathon veteran by the time I got my PhD in veterinary medicine and 2010. I relocated to Melbourne, Australia when I came 10th overall in the AAAF Gold Rated 2015 Sydney Marathon, which qualified me for the Rio Olympics and made me Australian champion to boot. For various reasons which centered around my not really being fast enough, I wouldn't go to Rio, but a year later everything in my life fell into place for me to fly to the US to attempt the impossible. So of all the running stories I might have chosen to emulate why Forrest Gump's, well, if you're a runner who's had the pleasure of passing a gang of youth or a bar, especially if you have long hair and God forbid a beard, I'd be willing to bet you've heard the shouts of run Forrest run. So of all the running stories, I might have chosen to emulate why Forrest Gumps. Well, if you're a runner, who's had the pleasure of passing a gang of youths or a bar, especially if you have long hair and God forbid a beard, I'd be willing to bet you've heard the shouts of run Forrest, run. His assimilation into the perception of the world of running, despite his distinguished military career and, and stint as a top level ping pong player, is so complete that anyone who undertakes a challenge more than a few marathons long seems to be labeled as the insert adjective or nationality here, Forrest Gump. I was 38 when I started, the same age as Tom Hanks, when he filmed the movie. And while that's not young for an athlete, it's not ter a terrible age to attempt a long distance run and America had always represented magic and excitement to me. It was a country of music and film legends, of stories and adventure, whether it was Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, or even uh, non-American singing about a place where the streets were nameless. I'd been inspired to dream of running through the Nevada desert, the Joshua Tree National Park and Chicago, across the Mississippi, past Atlantic Records, Graceland and the Big Rock Candy Mountain. I spent uh, endless hours poring over precious crossings and possible routes, studying the, the weather in different states at different times of the year, wondering whether I could actually hack it. Forrest says in the movie that he ran for three years, two months, 14 days and 16 hours. 
Many commenters have argued that his achievement has not phys was not physically possible, that he, the human body could simply not withstand the daily grind of running such distances for so long. Then, one day, I came across a book by a British chap named Nick Baldock, who had run from San Francisco to New York in 1999. He described the epic scale and beauty of the country in a way that utterly captivated me. I was hooked. I emailed him 10 years after his feat in May 20, uh, 2009 with the subject field Forrest Gump 2, and he replied with some advice. Funding was, apart from the running itself, the single biggest challenge. I gave myself a good 12 to 14 months to prepare both financially and fitness wise. You no doubt are younger and fitter, so that may not be the case with you. Rob, it is a wonderful thing to do. I could never tell you just how hard it was. But equally, it was truly a life changing experience for 132 days for me the best way to see America. Dolly inspired but Dolly warned, Nadine and I t worked our butts off in the veterinary surgery, pooling together enough savings to keep us going for as long as possible. In terms of the physical preparation, I knew I was, ha was a half decent runner, but this was the complete unknown. I couldn't even call myself a true ultra runner, the title reserved for those who had gone beyond the marathon distance. But a couple of months before I was due to depart for the forest run, I entered the run stock ultra with a friend from Australia, Flynn Hargreaves. Hmm. I clocked up 75 kilometers or 47 miles in old money. And while it wasn't exactly a breeze, I did feel, it did feel doable. I ran for the WWF Worldwide Fund for Nature in that event. As a keen animal lover, the WWF have always had a place in my heart and I decided to fundraise for them during the Forest Gump Run too. I would also be running for Peace Direct, a charity dedicated to stopping war and building lasting peace in some of the world's most fragile countries. And if these organizations weren't enough, there was one other source of inspiration for me, perhaps the most important and fundamental of all, my mama. As Forrest would say, as Forrest would say, my mom, Kathy Pope, was a medical lab laboratory scientific officer and a hardworking single mother. She was my rock and my best friend. She was only too pleased I had also chosen a scientific career and as a passionate supporter of my running, she took me to my races and marathons, even to the 1997, uh, 1997 New York Marathon. She was diagnosed with cancer, but that didn't stop her enrolling at university to study law and the and she was top of her class before she became too ill to continue. If I'd inherited even a fraction of her grit, I knew I'd be okay. While she was sick, she had made me promise one thing to her. Do one thing in your life that makes a difference. That promise has stuck with me since then and it has become a part of everything I hope to achieve. She passed away um, in 2002. She is my inspiration, my frustration, my warrior queen, my support crew leader. I still miss her now. And so for these particular reasons, on Thursday, 15 September, I stepped out of Flukes Barbers and decided to go for a little run. Gump movie fans will of course know that he is from Greenbow, Alabama, where he was raised dutifully by his mama and there where he would meet Jenny, the love of his life. From there, he would take the first steps on, that, on what turned out to be a remarkable journey. The problem was that Greenbow does not exist and never has. The Gump family home was even built especially for the film and no longer stands in its South Carolina location, so I couldn't 
even bend the narrative and start from there. The book on which the film was based, however, was by Mobile native Winston Groom, and so it became, and so it came to pass of, that forests and therefore my story began there too. I was in full gum paraphernalia, chinos, check shirt, a pristine new pair of white Nike Cortez, and sitting in a chair out front of the Bragg Mitchell Mansion. A grand Greek, Greek revival plantation house on the outskirts of the city and the closest thing I could find to the novel raised Gump boarding house in the district. I put on my red bubble gum shrimp CEO cap, uh, rose slowly and broke into a walk, then a jog, then a run. I ran to the end of the road. When I got there, I thought maybe I'd run to the end of town. On reaching the fork in the road, I decided to go right rather than left and got a bit lost. It wouldn't be my first wrong turn. Hot, humid night had fallen like a stone over the mobile skyline and I was running blind. I headed over to the parking lot of a family dollar store and tapped on the window of a lady sitting in her car. She lowered her window around half an inch, looking completely petrified behind the glass, but she thankfully pointed me in the right direction. Of course, I was yet to adjust to the life of a guy who just eats, runs, sleeps. So when I finally caught up with her, Nadine was hugely relieved to see me again. She'd been on the verge of filing a missing, missing persons report by the police. We went out to a little place called the OK Bicycle Shop, where no bicycles were available for sale or rent, but the beer was good and the pro proprietors, Jim and Woody, bought into the idea of the run. The pro they promised me they'd get in touch with Winston Groom, may he sadly now rest in peace, and I told them I'd, back, I'd be back soon as I headed out of the door and steadily enough to suggest it run a lot further than the five miles I covered that evening. As is the way of many of barroom conversation, neither of these things ever happened, but we were all richer for the doubt, for the thought. We indulged in a comfortable night in the Malaga Inn, a last little a last little touch of luxury that I felt Nadine deserved after the previous few days in America getting ready for this and the months of turmoil before. We were going to be able to get into a proper rhythm until we had the RV, which we were picking up in Houston, Texas. So in the meantime, we were making do with motors and car hire. I lay in bed staring at the ceiling listening to the distant sounds of the city winding down. I was convincing myself that I would, that it would all be fine and that we'd get to Bayou La Batre, a, marath a marathon or so from downtown Mobile by the close of play the next day. Waking up in the morning, I felt like the real deal. I'd woken up in countless hotels and friends' houses over the years prior to a big race and this had the same buzz about it. Wearing slightly more subtle attire than the previous day's outfit, which was barely dry after being soaked in sweat the night the evening before, I stepped into the morning. In Liverpool parlance, the sun was cracking the flags as I took the deep breath and began the journey. I passed some antebellum houses and some street art telling me to get the party started on the way to Highway 90. It was already 30 degrees by 11 a.m. It was already 30 degrees by 11 a.m. and started to feel pretty oppressive under rapidly graying skies. The heavens raptured in a deluge in a deluge ensuring that within minutes of getting the party started, I was running through a two inch deep urban torrent. This was my lot of the rest of the day. I thought it was a novel feeling to be running in rain that felt like a hot shower. I prematurely called it quits at the gas station at the intersection for Bajou-la-Batre and 
managed to watch Liverpool win their soccer match against Chelsea over a pint of fat tire, pale ale, and a gallon of lemonade to wash down the first of my mega meals on the run. But Jules Batre was a 20 mile detour that I vowed to avoid making a habit of. But I'd have a betrayal of Bubba Forrest's best good Bubba, Forrest's best good friend, played by Michael T. Williamson in the movie, who hailed from the town not to have gone to pay my respects. Forrest would have wanted it that way, staring down the Cypress Line Paget's switch road on my approach the next day i pressed play on the most appropriate music for the time and place only credence clear what our revival would do i ran past a portaloo with a gotta go slogan embossed on the site and as forrest said when he needed to go he went so i did approaching the bay i ran past a lot of shrimping boats in the final mile or two and watched a few head out in the gulf of mexico beyond i got in well paddled and took a sample of water which i hoped to mix with some water from the pacific if i got there and tick transcontinental run off the list i reached the water's edge to find that nat nats and her camera had already be already located the local wildlife with pelicans kamikaze diving into the bay and hermit crabs hiding if you got too close only to re-emerge about 10 seconds later to check that you left them to their business i'd have laid low a little longer personally nadine and i stood silently taking it all in before i set off on a short run back to town to rendezvous to rendezvous with nadine at the waffle house by this stage, I was hot and bothered and a bit shaky, which was likely a touch of heat stroke. Waffle House was a chain of restaurants whose calor calorific, tasty and inexpensive food would serve me well on this trip. The staff were lovely and our server, Lay, in particular, was fascinated by it all and gave us $10 for the WWF because as she put put it she loves her animals this was the first time of many acts of kindness i was to experience across the country and my heart uh, and my heat stress excuse me helped by helped by the wonderful air con had miraculously vanished i got about 1500 calories in in the form of hash browns covered in um, chili, a burger, and four refills of coke. I was trying to get a full marathon on the board today, knowing I'd need to start covering more distance if I was going to make Santa Monica in 75 or so days. I set off a bit quickly. My heavy, fizzy stomach felt rough for the next five miles and was probably instrumental in the lack of concentration that led to my missing my scheduled turning and ending up not too far from where I'd started. Oh no. An extra four or five miles hurts that late in the day. Way foreign missteps were already becoming a worrying habit and I was in a stinker of a mood. I very nearly packed it in for the day, but finally decided to push on. I reached a town called St. Elmo, where I could see the first of the huge water towers that had perhaps lain dormant since the 1938 War of the Worlds radio broadcast. They'd be signposting my way for the whole route, and as I made this my first full marathon day, I finished feeling victorious. We headed out for a Mexican to celebrate and walking down the, and excuse me, we headed out for a Mexican to celebrate and walking down the parade of shops on the way. I spied a display of Trump and Clinton Halloween mass. I thought about getting a couple to run in, but something told me that was a bad idea. There was an election on the horizon and I wasn't sure if my sense of humor was quite in tune with the mute of the country. 
I kicked off day four wearing my Victoria vest, last worn in the Australian Marathon Championships. But in truth, most of my kit choices were fleeting because at each rest, rest break, I would change into fresh clothes and throw my sodden gear into a bag. I could have filled a pint glass when I wrung them out first. A few miles down the road, I had to go again, so I went. I crept through a gap in the trees and a spider web slightly brushed my face. Having gained valuable frontline experience in Australia, I instantly stopped and checked to see what the situation was. A tiny spider on a big web seemed a bit strange, but wait a minute. An absolute behemoth with pointy yellow striped legs was the main breadwinner here and was making a beeline towards me. I was out of there fast. When I looked into it later, I learned that this was a female black and yellow garden spider, which might not sound too scary, but you but you weren't there. Its bite is aching, akin to a nasty wasp sting. And if you see a picture of one, you know, ma'am. Today was a big day as we were making our first state line crossing with the strains of ultraviolet light my way by U2 coming through my earphones as the UV beat down heavily um, from above. I'd done it. I'd run across the great state of Alabama, just like Forrest, like the man himself, though he had more to do. I was having a lot of trouble regulating my pace. I typically run easy around 6.45 minutes per mile and jog at around 7.30, but a number of experienced runners had advised me that this was just too fast to sustain over transcontinental distances. Often, I'd average under seven minutes for my early stints and struggle later in the day, so I would need to mellow out to eight minutes per mile, so even slower paces to even or even slower paces when I took on Mississippi, which will come in the next chapter. Reads very well. I love this. Um, so again, this is Becoming Forest by Rob Pope. Um, this is the call number and it's available on our new shelf um i hope you enjoyed this little reading and i see you again in two weeks bye